John Swallow, former Utah Attorney General, thank you so much for coming by and being part of Three Questions today. Bob, it's my pleasure. Last year, you won a court judgment where in the state of Utah got some bad news. They were going to have to pay your legal bills since you were exonerated on nine counts of uh, uh, corruption. <laughs> uh, that must have made you feel pretty good. Well, I mean, anytime you win, it's a great thing. And certainly we knew all along that I was innocent. And so we're grateful because the system did, did work this time. Sometimes it doesn't work, and there are a lot of people who are convicted who are innocent. And so we felt very fortunate and, and great about the result, of course. Have they paid you the money that you were owed, and was it enough to retire your legal debts? Uh, yes. In just a few weeks ago, uh, we reached a settlement with the state of Utah, and they did pay our family a million and a half dollars, uh, which was enough to retire all the legal bills that we had uh, incurred and pay off some of our personal debts that we'd incurred in defending myself from the false charges. Mm. Now, since you were exonerated, you've had to keep body and soul together somehow. Right. You're no longer the Attorney General of Utah, and you've got the, the specter of this whole episode hanging over you. How have you kept body and soul together? Well, financially, I, I've never lost my license to practice law, and so right after I left office, I joined a small law firm and continued to practice law, having to continue to work to pay the bills, and we've been able to survive financially by my practice in law. And I currently have clients, and my firm is growing very well, and uh, we've been really happy that people trust me enough to hire me and engage me to solve their legal problems, and it's been a great experience for me moving forward. What kind of law are you practicing now? Well, I do some government work, and I also do in other states, and I also do um, mostly business consulting work and legal work for clients that are businesses. So if they have a contract issue or a litigation problem, I handle that in my firm. Have you been able to figure out why corruption charges were filed against you? At what point, where in that whole episode was the tipping point that, that the powers of be said we're going after John Swallow on corruption? You know, that's the most interesting question that I think I've ever been asked because we don't see any basis, never did, for any kind of criminal charges to be filed. In fact, the State Bar, which is the entity that's charged with like policing the, e the ethics of lawyers, they actually investigated everything as well and reviewed all the evidence, and they cleared me on any ethics issues. And so there really was nothing there. And if you went to the trial and listened, there was nothing there. We have concluded that it was political. And that's why I was charged, and it was, which is a, another commentary for another question, because if you can do this to someone like the sitting attorney general and not have a basis in it, who is safe from the type of abuse of power that can happen to anybody in this country where prosecutors have this unmitigated power to do whatever they want to to charge anybody for anything? So what were you and Mark Shirtliff doing at Pelican Hill then? Well, I was there before I was even in the Attorney General's office. I actually was representing a client there, the same person who later testified under oath that I shouldn't have been there. And that was the crazy thing about it. Now, Mark was the Attorney General at the time, but I was in private practice. There was nothing inappropriate at all for my being at Pelican Hill before I joined the Office of Attorney General. What about Mark Shirtliff? Was it inappropriate for him to be there? I think you'd have to ask Mark Shirtliff that question. Mm. Okay. Here in Utah, the political system has uh, county attorneys running uh, partisan races. In other words, they have to declare their political party affiliation. How does that affect justice being served in those jurisdictions? You know, one of the things that I've learned going forward, and I didn't really fully appreciate even as attorney general, is the absolute power and discretion a prosecutor has. Of all, of all the offices in our country, the most powerful is the prosecutor, and the least uh, guarded is the prosecutor. Um, a governor, for example, has a legislature that is a check and a balance to the governor. The legislature has a governor and other members as a check and a balance, but the prosecutor has no one supervising him or her. It's an elected position, and so it is ripe for abuse politically. And one of the things I'd like to work on going forward is reform, to take what's called unqualified immunity 
or in other words, a, a, no, no check and a balance of a prosecutor away from the prosecutor so that if they misuse their power, they can suffer a consequence. Today, there is no consequence for a misuse of prosecutorial power. And what would be that balance of power for a prosecutor? How would you institute that? One of the ideas is, first of all, in, in the legislative process through a statute to remove what's called unqualified immunity and say prosecutors have qualified immunity, which means that if they abuse their power, they're no longer immune. That's number one. Number two, in every state in our country, we have a, what's called a judicial conduct commission. It's a police kind of agency over the conduct of judges where someone can file a complaint against a judge and it gets screened by an independent body. There's nothing like that for prosecutors. And I would like Utah to follow the step of New York, which just recently enacted a, a, a conduct commission for prosecutors. There, that, through that vehicle, then if you have a complaint against a prosecutor, an independent body can then police and, and verify and really decide whether there was an abuse of political power by the prosecutor. You were exonerated, but Jeremy Johnson, who implicated you, confessed to a, being involved in a bribery plot or scandal involving a very powerful U.S. senator at the time. Where is that investigation now? Well, there is a prosecutor named Troy Rawlings who is investigating that um, bribe confession by Jeremy Johnson, who's now serving a prison term on an unrelated matter. Um, I think it's ironic that the person who accused me of wrongdoing is now in federal prison. Uh, but later on, after he made those accusations against me, he came to us and he confessed that he, he felt badly that he'd mischarged me for something I had no involvement with. Mm. And I, I'm very comfortable with the fact that Jeremy Johnson is sorry for what he did with respect to kind of jump-starting this whole concern about me as the Attorney General, and I uh, forgive him for that. So was there bribery going on involving a very powerful U.S. Senator? Well, I can't, I can't really answer that question, but, if you, but there are people who have investigated that, who have information about that, and who believe that that is what happened. Uh, it was unrelated to me, but it certainly was related to Mr. Johnson, who confessed to it, and to this powerful U.S. Senator who no longer is in office. Mm. It's concerning. It, it really is concerning that uh, Mr. Johnson, who confessed to, uh, a, to giving a bribe to a U.S. senator, um, has, has not been investigated, when I say that, charged with uh, that crime that he admitted, and neither has this senator who um, Mr. Why Johnson not? has fingered as accepting the bribe. Why not? Why has, why has that confession gone uncharged? From what I understand, there are powers, political powers that be that have kept that from happening. I know that sounds awfully conspiratorial, but from what I understand, that's what's happened. And, um, and there is someone who's looking at that deeply now who's actually seeking funds uh, to try to get a grand jury started to actually explore that because it impacted the House investigation into me, which this prosecutor believes was skewed because of that. Mm. When a political scandal overtakes an office, such as the Attorney General's office, or any other office for that matter, how does the day-to-day -day operation of that office, the people's work, how does that get done? Well, fortunately, there are a lot of very good lawyers and staff members at the Attorney General's office. And one of the reasons I decided to step down and clear my name privately, which is what we were able to do, was because of the impact the investigations were having on the office and on the work of the people. So my wife and I looked at each other and we looked at our finances that were dwindling and we said, this can't be good for the state, it can't be good for us. Let's do the right thing, let's step aside and let's try to solve this as private citizens. And that's the decision I made. I feel good about that decision and I'm grateful for how everything turned out. It was the right thing for the state, it was the right thing for our family. Where is your confidence now in the US justice system? My confidence personally, I think that there are many people in the justice system that are trying their best to do a great job, but I believe there are serious political problems in the justice system, both federally and even in the state of Utah. And if I had the ability to fix it, I would. Um, there are things we can do to, to make a difference, to change it. And I've talked off 
record with you about one of those things, and that is about the, the prosecutor having unlimited authority and power that can't be challenged or questioned by anybody. We need to fix that in America and change that. There's no other office in the country where the head of any department or agency or even the president of the United States has carte blanche to do anything they want without anyone looking at them except for the prosecutor. And it's the most powerful position in government. We need to fix that. Are you bitter? And if not, why not? You know, I'm not bitter. I, I, uh, I feel blessed to have had the opportunity and privilege to serve. I got into politics as a young member of the Utah legislature. Right away, I started to drive policy. I, I, was, I passed the largest tax cut in the history of our state as a, like a sophomore in the legislature. I've had many great experiences, and now I have my life back and my freedom. Now people know, people who are thoughtful understand that it wasn't true, and so I feel like I'm getting my reputation back. And so if I could have looked at today where I am today, five years ago, and said I would be here today, my debts paid off, uh, exonerated, um, having my life back as a 56-year-old and able to make decisions based on purpose, I would have taken this moment 100 out of 100 times. I feel so blessed and grateful to have a wonderful family and, and wife and to have my, my life back, I just feel, I don't feel bitter, I feel blessed and grateful for all my blessings. How has this whole ordeal affected your family and your friendships? Well, let me get to my family first. I can't say enough great things about my wife, Suzanne, who was by my side and believed in me the whole way through. And we had serious conversations and I said, Suzanne, this looks like it's gonna get really rough, but I want you to know it's not true. Are you with me? And she just threw it right by my side. She walked with me hand in hand through the whole ordeal. And she didn't sign up for any of this, right? No. Um, my friends, I learned who my real friends are. And a lot of my real friends didn't abandon me. And that meant the world to me. And now I feel like I've got my life, I've put back together, I'm moving forward, and I'm looking for purpose. And I feel like our best years our best contribution in society are ahead of us rather than behind us. And I'm full of that American optimism that first drove me to get elected to office in the first place. And I feel like I can make a great contribution moving forward. And I'm full of hope. And I have my, my wife and my family to thank for that. You and former Attorney General Mark Shurtleff were involved in what has been called the biggest political scandal in Utah history. Both of you have been either had the charges dropped against you or you've been acquitted at trial. And now you have this history, this chapter, this episode in your lives that will follow you everywhere you go. What have you learned about yourself and about other people through this whole ordeal? That's a, I appreciate that question. I, I, I will say this, it's the biggest fabricated scandal in the history of our state. What have I learned? I have learned the power of believing in people, believing in trust. I, I've, I've learned that many people go through tough times in their lives. I've learned to become a much better listener and a much better friend as I've looked at people go through tough times and I've, I've developed an empathy and an understanding that I never could have developed had I not gone through an experience like this. And there's not a person I talk to that doesn't have a, a family member who's gone through a false accusation or another family member who's gone through terminal cancer or a, a debilitating disease or a car accident. And I just feel full of empathy and love for people who go through tough times. And I, I walk around, frankly, with a prayer in my heart that, that uh, people won't have to suffer as much as, as we had to suffer because it took us to the very bottom and the very top at the same time. I can't explain it, but it was a rough experience, but an experience we came through because of people who were sympathetic and empathetic with us and who offered a hand and a prayer, and then we were able to learn the power of giving a hand and a prayer back. And I think that's the greatest lesson I take from this. You were very well versed in the law prior to this whole episode happening, but what have you learned more specifically through going through this experience? What have you learned about the laws of this country and how they're adjudicated? You know, I learned that the Founding Fathers were right, that government is power, and that we as people need the protections of our founding documents, our Constitution, in order to have a chance against the 
awesome power of government. I, I also learned to have a little empathy for other people who are falsely charged. I was fortunate because as a public employee, they paid my attorney's fees when I was acquitted and exonerated, right? right? But most people don't have that blessing, and so they have to endure the weight of government, and even if they're innocent when they're acquitted, they have to shoulder all of the expense of that, which can run in the hundreds of thousands of dollars and even millions of dollars, like in my case, on their own. Then I think the laws need to be changed to provide more um, protections to individuals, which is right in line with the, what the Founding Fathers did in preparing a constitution for us and a bill of rights that guaranteed me a jury trial where these eight common yet uncommonly courageous citizens did what they needed to do. They listened to the evidence, they made a judgment and determined I wasn't guilty of any of it. And I owe them my freedom and my life and I owe that to the founding fathers as well and our constitutional documents. If you could go back and select one thing out of this whole episode that you would change, what would it be? I think I would have tried to be better prepared financially before I went into public service. I'm writing a book on this. Um, I'm, I've, I've come up with three different sections of the book. One is called Prevention of a False Allegation, what you can do to have policies in place that can protect you from being accused. And then the middle section is about preparation. And that preparation deals with, you know, finances. It deals with experiences that you can have that will prepare you to kind of run the gauntlet of a false accusation. And the third section is about having the courage of your conviction to see it through. So like I was offered a, a deal and my wife and I talked about it just for a moment. And we decided, well, we hadn't done anything. I hadn't done anything wrong. There was no way I was even going to uh, concede to having done a misdemeanor, committed a misdemeanor. So that courage of conviction is what carries you through the long pathway to, to proving your innocence. So prevention, preparation, and, um, and then having the courage of your convictions to get through. What would I change? Probably my preparation. I think I would have, because I, one of the reasons I stepped aside was because we just certainly couldn't continue to spend $50,000 a month mm. as regular people to defend myself while I was in office. So I had to step aside and take care of things outside of the public eye. If you could give some advice to either current or future elected office leaders, elected leaders, in regard to avoiding the kind of trouble that you found yourself in, what advice would you give them? I think the advice I would give is, would be to the legislature and maybe to the people of Utah, and that would be that the attorney general position, being the chief law enforcement officer of the state and having that unlimited power to prosecute and make decisions that are important, shouldn't, shouldn't be asking people for financial contributions for a campaign. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds a little unusual, but we're built on a system in America where we ask for contributions. But if you're a member of the legislature, there's a check and a balance. You have to convince a lot of other members to vote for your bill, right? If you're the governor of the state, you still have a check and a balance. So you can't make decisions in a vacuum. But as a prosecutor, you can. And so by virtue of my asking people for a contribution, I became a suspect of asking for it in return for a favor. And so I was actually prosecuted, in my view, for doing what we do in the American political system, trying to raise money so I could get elected, but having that power to make decisions. And so people would say, oh, it's a this for that, because you're the attorney general. So what advice would I give? It would be to the legislature and maybe the people to consider a way that people can campaign for a prosecution office, whether it's in the county or in the state that doesn't involve raising campaign contributions from people who could influence the decision making of that one person. Because that was the linchpin that they tried to say, just because I, I raised money from people, that somehow I was offering a deal in return for the contribution, which wasn't true. But that is the advice I think I would give, is people in, in the public forum need to think about how we set up the system with respect to our prosecutors, because we give prosecutors so much power. John Swallow, former Attorney General for the great state of Utah, thank you so much for being part of Three Questions. It's been a pleasure to be with you, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you.